Every form of life on Earth is a compilation of adaptations that have evolved over time. You can find adaptations pretty much anywhere you can find life on Earth, but it's easier to learn about them when they're up close. So for this month's adaptations field trip, we are going to get up close and personal with some of these amazing adaptations of life on Earth right here at Animal Wonders Montana. On this field trip, we have a special guide that's gonna lead us through. I am here with Jesse right now. Hi guys, I'm Jesse. I'm the director of Animal Wonders. I like to do a lot of teaching with animals and adaptations is my favorite topic. And what I tell the kids, a very simple description of it is something an animal has or does that helps them survive. Having it or doing it, it's neat to think about things that are physical and things that are behavioral. Yes, yeah, the hidden ones are some of my favorites to share. A lot of the adaptations we see with Life on Earth are all about defensive tactics. Right, and those are sometimes like the most obvious ones as well. We're gonna actually see several individuals today, right? We're gonna get yes. a few different taxonomic groups, so that's how we categorize different life on Earth. You guys are gonna see everything from mammals to birds yeah. to reptiles and amphibians mm -hmm. and invertebrates. Let's do it, let's go. We are going to check out the adaptations for the group that is reptiles. Meet Blueberry, the blue tongue skink. A skink is a kind of a lizard. Um, generally, they have a, a shorter, thicker neck, long body, and little legs. So she has this blue tongue. It is actually a warning color, so she's mimicking animals that actually put a lot of effort into creating a poison or a toxin. So when an animal comes close, they're like, nope, warning colors, warning colors, you don't want to eat me. But she has no poison or venom. She's totally tricking them. We would know very clearly if she was trying to defend herself. So she would open her mouth very wide, and she would stick her tongue out inflate it a bit, and then she would wiggle it around in the air like blah, 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 blah like that. <laughs> Being like, look at me. <laughs> Don't eat me. <laughs> in addition to using the tongue and making this larger display, they will also exhibit some body characteristics too, right? Flattening yes. out or kind of presenting a different, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you can imagine that because there is right, so much, there's all this tissue. And, yeah, all that girth. And so imagine if you were using that, but then putting it in different angles to be bigger. So if those don't work, she will attempt to run away and hide into a bush, kind of like what she's doing right now. And then she's got this tail that's displayed. That's kind of like her hidden defense. So if something tries to grab her, prevent her from going into a bush, they'll grab her tail and pull and the tail will come off. And then it has vasoconstriction very quickly. It just stops bleeding, scabs up, heals over, and then regrows itself. Which is absurd and awesome and amazing. <laughs> the next individual we are going to look at is an amphibian. Who do we have? We have Slick the Tiger Salamander. Aww. He has some pretty obvious defense mechanisms and that goes with his color here. If you take a look at his color, you'll see that well, he can camouflage a bit if he's mm. burrowed down into the dirt. If he is exposed, he has bright colors on yes. him. Bright colors usually are a warning that they're poisonous or venomous. These guys have a poison gland underneath their tail. He would turn his tail sideways and a milky substance would come out of that poison gland and that would be the poison. And then he'd kind of wiggle around and try and get it on his tail and his body as much of him as he could so that not only does he taste terrible, right. but he, he will cause quite a bellyache if he's eaten. And now we're gonna be talking about some birds. This is Maui and this is Ginger and they're both mm. green cheek conures, also known as green cheek parakeets. So birds, one of the first thing that kind of comes to mind in terms of adaptations or things that just stand out are coloration, right? Yes. They have the same kind of tone, but right. one is much darker than the other. And this is Ginger over here, she's the dark one. This is the natural color they would be in the wild. And Maui here, she is what you call a pineapple coloration and that is human made. She would not do very well in the wild. It's interesting to have the color bread, right, for Maui, because yeah. when you think about defense, um, some of the most amazing defenses that we see in the, in the animal kingdom or in life in general is camouflage. Right. So the reason why you wouldn't see Maui's coloration just out in the wild is because that, that camouflage defense has to match the surroundings. Exactly. So if she was born in the wild, she would basically be a neon sign for predators saying, <laughs> eat me. Hello. Uh -huh. <laughs> so she would not only blend in with the foliage around her, but also the rest in her flock. Aside from just not being seen, if you are seen, there's then the step two, right? So if you are seen by yes. a predator, then what? Flight is huge huge. Birds have evolved and put so much energy into making this defense work for them. Right. I mean, their entire physiology is geared 
for them to be able to fly. And it's kind of the, that idea that the defense can also be offense if you are a, a, a bird that is hunting and actively utilizing yes. flight to come from something from above. Exactly, yeah. Do you want to show off that adaptation of flight? Yeah, I would actually love to. What do Let's you think, go Ginger? Ahead and do that. Yeah. All right. You are so sweet. Hi. Hello. Are you ready? Nice. There she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and now a word, not from our sponsors, but from the dictionary. Welcome to this month's Wild Word. Once a month on Nature League, we'll look at the etymology or origin and history of words related to nature. This month's theme is adaptation, so we're going to examine a word that represents one of the most common predator and prey adaptations on Earth. The word is camouflage. Ah yes, that word that makes you thankful for autocorrect. And it's no wonder. It's not so English spelling has to do with its not so English language of origin. The word camouflage can actually be traced back to several languages, and the complicated journey camouflage took to get into English is definitely part of why it's so obnoxious to spell. The most recent leg of camouflage's etymological journey was in France. The French word camoufle is a slang term which means to disguise which is pretty much how we use this word in English. This French word most likely came from the Italian word camuffare, which also means to disguise. However, we still haven't gone back far enough. The Italian camuffare is most likely a combination of two separate Italian words, capo, which means head, and muffare, which means something similar to muffle or dampen. Capo is derived from the Latin caput, meaning head, so the word goes back even farther. However, it's interesting to note that some topic experts believe that the French word camoufle is itself a reference to the word camoufle, which actually means something along the lines of a slap in the face or a snub. Although the origin of the word is a bit all over the place, the majority of its source words mean something like disguise, and that meaning hasn't changed since entering the English language. It just so happens that the entering the English language bit is one of my favorite things about this word. The word camouflage wasn't used in English until the early 1900s, and one of its first usages is totally fascinating. In the August 1917 edition of Popular Science Monthly, the magazine published a piece that started by mentioning different photographs of British and French war terrain disguises that they'd previously published. The article reads, Until recently, there was no one word in any language to explain this war trick. Sometimes a whole paragraph was required to explain this military practice. Hereafter, one word, a French word, will save all this needless writing and reading. Camouflage is the new word, and it means fooling the enemy. So while the origins of the word camouflage existed in languages around the world, including French, Italian, and Latin, it took a world war to get it into the English language. And that is pretty wild. During our Biodiversity Month, we talked about invertebrates, which make up the majority of all life on Earth. So we would be remiss if we did not check out some adaptations of an invertebrate. This is Professor Claw, and she's an emperor scorpion. Everything about her is an adaptation for her to survive, but um, the biggest one that she needs is defense. And these guys are the second largest scorpion in the world, so they are huge, but because they don't have really intense venom, they need other ways to defend themselves, and so they have adapted the huge claws. Their sensory is part of the way that they both defend and hunt. It's yeah. both defense and offense. And that's it's interesting because like their defenses are also their offenses. Like yeah. they, they're all rolled into one. She's not trying to pinch me. She is using her claws to feel this rough terrain. She's like, I'm not sure why it keeps going up and down. And so uh, these guys have kind of terrible eyesight and their eyes are on top of their carapace there. So in order to figure out what's going on, they put their claws out in front of them. That's going to help make sure that she stays safe wherever she's going. And if she does run into a predator or a piece of food, Either she or. can uh, sense it and she can grab it. The hairs on her claws, those aren't real hairs, folks. They are a special part of her exoskeleton. So you could actually more accurately call them a kind of a bristle. This is the home of Kismet, the African crested porcupine. In the wild, I would absolutely be afraid of an animal that looked like this because, I mean, she is giving you all the warnings. She's got the, the stripes and the pokes, and she even has an auditory warning as well, saying, if you come closer, I'm gonna use these on you. So these guys are up against all the large mammals yeah. in Africa, lions and hyenas and leopards. They can actually take these amazing quills and run them through a lion. Right now, it looks like she's wearing a skirt, but when she is on defensive mode, right. all of these quills, she flexes muscles on her back and her quills come up. And so it looks like her, her crest goes up, but also right. she just becomes gigantic. She becomes three times her size. Right. And she's also 
shaking her quills at you, so it's going and and it's very intimidating. You can kind of see where her tail would be. It is her tail, and they are white, just clear quills under there, and they have this special adaptation where they're hollow, right mm -hmm. there. And so when she shakes her tail, that those hollow ones, they just they hit together and make that noise. For something to be hollow right next to something that's used as a complete spear, right? It's so different. <laughs> these are the guard hairs. So these are what you see on the top here. Much um, more flexible. Yep, they don't even have a really. They kind of have a pointy tip, but they're not. They're not going to go into anything. Right. This is the danger poke right there. So you can see the flexibility. There just isn't any. It's so rigid and right. it's. Thick. These porcupines are different than New World porcupines mm -hmm. from South America because they don't have a barbed tip. So they have to have a lot of force behind their poke mm -hmm. um, so that it embeds and it damages that animal enough to give them a lasting impression right. so they don't mess with these guys again. So as you've seen, all life on Earth is just full of adaptations that have happened either over millions of years or even in the recent past, and they all have to do with surviving and thriving. It's so incredible to get to see them up close, and I would not have been able to do that without having you here and uh, being hosted here at Animal Wonders. So thank you for letting us see these up close and Absolutely. talk about them. I'm so glad. I mean, I love talking about the animals. I love sharing them. And I just feel privileged to be able to take care of them so that I can share them with others. Absolutely. Thank you guys for watching this Nature League field trip. And we will see you next week for a special Denatured All About Adaptation. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.